Well, I'm not sure if we'll be the spiciest panel, but we can sure as heck try, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm indebted to Franciscan University and to my friend Saurabh Amari for the invitation to be here today. Y you know, some folks say that Saurabh can be a bit irritable or pugnacious on social media sometimes, and I, I have three things to say in response to that. <laughs> first, I suspect Saurabh will be the first to admit that he can be a little bit pugnacious on social media at times. If anything, I think he would probably say that is now firmly a part of his brand. Second, I know that I speak for myself in saying that I can also be a little bit pugnacious on social media at times. So Sorev's oh-so-civil critics should also come at me. Third and most important, Sorev has personally never been anything but exceedingly generous, supportive, and kind to me, and I'm grateful for your camaraderie and your friendship. Thank you. Our, our topic today is what is new in the so-called New Right, which is an ascendant but still somewhat hazily defined movement that, like many of you, I very much consider myself a part of. So on the one hand, I hate the New Right label. It is self-consciously non-descriptive and non-normative. There have uh, furthermore been previous American iterations of warring New Right and Old Right clans. Indeed, one could suggest that the Frank Meyer, William F. Buckley Jr. fusionists or the Irving Crystal, Norm Potharitz neocons were the so-called New Right intellectuals of their own day in contrast to the then old right, represented by folks like Ohio's own Senator Robert Taft. So from this perspective, the new right label is lazy and unhelpful. On the other hand, I love the new right label. It emphasizes the youthful exuberance and passion of many of our leading thinkers, practitioners, and elected officials, as well as the younger generation's disaffection with, and perhaps even outright disdain for, the state of the right of center politics bequeathed to us by our elders. Those elders profligate in their personal lives and always eager to yell ahoy for one more National Review cruise have, have, demonstra <laughs> have demonstrably failed to conserve much of anything that is good, true, and beautiful about the American Republic and the American way of life. I channeled some of this frustration in a new Criterion response essay directed at the hapless ex-Heritage Foundation hack, Kim Holmes, that I provocatively titled, quote, yesterday's man, yesterday's conservatism. In that attitudinal sense, the new right description fits quite well. Substantively, the very basic outline of the new right agenda is easy enough, I think, to discern. On political economy, our agenda is more nationalist, more communitarian, and more invested in helping cultivate and advance the material conditions of real people who lead real lives. Not the laptop class, not the K Street class, not the hedge fund class. Some writings from recent years that come immediately to mind because I'm nothing if not a voracious consumer of right of center uh, essays and media content. One would be Julius Krein's May 2020 essay for American Compass's organizational rollout, which he entitled, quote, planning for when the market cannot which criticized the zombie Hayekianism that characterized the post-Cold War Washington consensus. And another essay that comes immediately to mind would be my own Edmund Burke Foundation colleague David Brog's November 2020 essay for American Affairs Journal about political economy in the Anglo-American tradition, which he entitled, quote, Up from Laissez-Faire, Reclaiming Conservative Economics. The new right in a nutshell argues that the neoliberal controlled opposition right was wrong was wrong, plain and simple, to renounce core elements of our own economic heritage, such as industry nourishing protective tariffs and prudential antitrust enforcement to prevent a profoundly corporate tyranny. We also recognize that even more so than the nation state, the institution around which all, all our economic policy ought to be crafted is the nuclear family. Thus, many of us embrace direct family support payments, Central European-style natalist policies, and or a mandatory paid family leave baseline, and we embrace these as both good politics and good policy alike. On culture, the new right recognizes that the only viable force in America capable of withstanding and turning back the woke onslaught is religion, which in America necessarily means Christianity. Wokeism, as has often been noted, already functions as a pseudo-religion with all the pieties, sacraments, rituals, and excommunications that one might expect from a more traditional and authentic religion. Overt, biblically grounded lawmaking, a concomitant, biblically informed constitutional jurisprudence, and an, appro and an approach to God in the public square 
that we might think of as, as Chad Pecknold would say, an ecumenical integralism, represent our only hope for recovery at this late hour in our ailing, decadent republic. Unborn children should be protected nationally under the protective ambit of the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. States should ban so-called gender reassignment surgeries for all their citizens, not merely minors. And Everson versus Board of Education and Engel versus Vital must be overturned to return the Bibles to our schools. The so-called culture war issues, in short, are the very heart and soul of the New Right movement. And as the governor of my adopted state of Florida showed when he used state power to bring the gender ideologues at the Walt Disney Company to heel earlier this year, these fights can be both popular and successful. We might even think of Governor DeSantis's victory over Mickey Mouse the groomer as the, <laughs> as the quintessential new right victory. He wielded political power to protect parents and children from the perverse depredations of a gender ideology besotted corporate behemoth, even when that behemoth happens to be one of the largest employers in the entire state. M much of the New Right's agenda can thus be thought of as, quote, deliberalizing and, quote, consolidationist, rejecting liberalism's dogmas across all areas of our political life. This systemic rejection of the old dogma extends from the brain worms of corporatist market fundamentalism to the hubris of moralistic foreign interventionism, to the conceit that the public square can ever be quote unquote values neutral, as if that were to ever end any other way other than fortifying our political foes and subjugating and dehumanizing our own people. To an extent, this simply entails what my good friend and co-panelist Rachel Bovard has sometimes referred to as a reshuffling of priorities placing a far greater emphasis on recovering and implementing a new conservatism's rich communitarian and consolidationist traditions after decades of misguided right liberal individualist excess that has broken down countless families, outsourced countless manufacturing jobs, and encouraged countless sexual fetishes. I agree that much of the new right does ultimately amount to reshuffling priorities. The wisdom of Koheleth comes to mind here that, quote, there is nothing new under the sun. But I do think that there are some new aspects of the so-called new right. Namely, we on the new right understand that the rightist politics now needed is one that must first build, not slash, and two, wield power, not abhor power. Let me just briefly elaborate. The neoliberal political impulse in both the economic and the cultural spaces has for decades been to slash, slash, and slash some more. In the economy, this has meant free trade absolutism, Wall Street unshackling, and the more general severing of any meaningful connection between economic statecraft and the sovereign citizenry. Cartoonish market fetishization, let the market rip, as Oren Cass calls it, leads to a world in which our feckless elites merely let the market's, quote, efficiency maximizing chips fall where they may, and then attempt, or not, to put the pieces back together on the other side of the fallout. Never mind all that deindustrialization or all those pesky deaths of despair. As the ghoulish Kevin Williamson memorably put it, quote, the truth about these dysfunctional downscale communities is that they deserve to die. The new right impulse, by contrast, is to rebuild the connection between the art of economic statecraft and the material, cultural, and spiritual well-being of the American people. That means rejecting overly intellectualized dogma about comparative advantages, natural monopolies, and the efficient market hypothesis. Instead, we must prefer aggressive industrial policies so that we can actually make things in America again antitrust enforcement against the big tech robber barons, common carriage laws to prevent invidious corporate discrimination against our subjugated and dehumanized people, workforce training and apprenticeships, apprenticeship programs to offer a viable alternative to the four-year college higher education cartel, and more broadly, the illiberal use of tax and subsidization policy to, to promote good and to punish and ban evil. Even more important, it means building, literally building, our very societal future 
As my friend Glenn and Pappen discussed earlier today, that means a robust material element to family policy measures. That means economic incentives for marriage and tax penalties for divorce, as Rusty Reno, who is also here, has previously suggested. And it means hard financial investment in organizations such as American Moment, on whose advisory board Rachel and I both serve, whose very purpose for existing is to quite literally build a talent base for the right. So this building imperative is something that I think the new right understands at this late hour of the republic. When it comes to political power, the natural corollary to the neoliberals imperative of slashing and severing at every opportunity imaginable is the reluctance to actually wield political power to do anything constructive. Consider one of my own areas, consider one of my own areas of specialty constitutional interpretation. How many times have you heard an effete right liberal bleat about how we must stick to the most rigid, constrained, and historicist interpretation of the text? lest we somehow embolden our adversaries to do the same, as, as if they are not doing so already and have not been openly and nakedly doing so since Caroline Products put no forward during the New Deal. <laughs> the same basic paradigm holds for when rightists dare to think outside the liberal box and, egad, wield legislative power to promote some values and punish others. These right liberals need to put their big boy pants on. Empir em empirically speaking, we are already living in a post-liberal world. Period, full stop, end of story. We live in a world where the President of the United States, who happens to be palpably senile while musing about nuclear Armageddon, orders pre-dawn FBI raids against his chief political foe. Tech platforms and financial services firms are weaponized by the ruling regime as putatively, quote unquote, private sector enforcement arms suppressing wrong think and barring wrong thinkers from access to the basic means and channels of commerce. Our imperative now must be to prudentially wield political power in the service of good political order, punishing enemies who would foster evil, much like Ron DeSantis punished Mickey Mouse the pedophile, and rewarding friends who would promote good. As I said in another recent speech for the Claremont Institute, we must, quote, engage in some of the tit-for-tat tactics our foes engage in protecting and rewarding our dehumanized voters and people by any lawful means necessary. If my friend David Boy's exhortation to quote, know what time it is, means anything, means anything at all, it means recognizing that this is the basic agenda that the late hour of our republic now demands, there is no honor whatsoever in so-called principled loserdom, let alone in losing to the ultimate losers, the wokesters who despise America, despise Western civilization, and despise all that is good, true, and beautiful in this world. So let's deliberalize, reconsolidate, build, and wield power to the best of our abilities so that America might actually defeat wokeism and still carry on, to paraphrase Burke himself, as a great partnership of generations dead, living, and unborn. Thank you very much.